Grace and peace to you all, and welcome to the Calvary Road with Pastor Sam Allen. Joseph was able not only to forgive, and this is the key for those of us who've been so wounded, so hurt, so misused or abused, to say, well, I just can't see how I could ever forgive that person. You can. He wouldn't command you to do it if he couldn't make it possible for you to do it or wouldn't make it possible for you to do it. But the way we forgive is we realize God's forgiven me everything. Well, happy Friday and welcome to a new two-part message from Pastor Sam that he has entitled, A Righteous Witness. We're still in Luke chapter 6 and we're going to finish this chapter by starting up in verse 37. The text we're looking at today covers what Jesus has to say about judging others. So let's listen in. Let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 6. We're picking up at verse 37 and completing the chapter, title of our study, A Righteous Witness. Our study of this particular section began with Jesus drawing his disciples to him and choosing from among the many disciples, 12, who he now calls apostles. The rest of what we consider in Luke 6 is all about the beginning of the discipleship process as he begins to be an example to them. And then, well, he's going to be teaching them. And the first thing he teaches them is, well, what they should be expecting is they go out to represent him to a self-righteous nation. And he wants them to get the bad news up front. You're going to be rejected and hated and mocked and scorned and slandered and well, that's the bad news. What's the good news? There isn't any good news. The, the next news is, well, here's how I need you to respond. If you're going to rightly represent me, you're going to return good for evil. Well, maybe that is the good news. You're going to get to return blessings for curses. You're going to get to love on people who hate me and hate you so that you can represent me to him. That's the call. So he tells them, here's what's going to happen. Here's how you're going to respond. And now he concludes with a series of exhortations and illustrations. He begins saying, hey, we got to stop judging. And he'll conclude by saying it's essential that we be obedient. Well, verse 37, he says, judge not and you shall not be judged. Condemn not and you shall not be condemned. Forgiven, you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Well, what he does as he begins in this section is he takes a couple very common responses to rejection or mocking or slander, the very things he said they would expect. And he says, it's not going to be that way with you. Later, he'll tell his disciples, you know how the Gentiles do things. You know how they lord it over those who are under them. And he's saying, you guys aren't going to be able to function like that. So it's more than in saying you're not to judge that the Greek itself is more emphatic and stronger. These are commands to literally stop judging and stop condemning. The implication is that will be my natural response. If I come with good news to someone that God loves them and has a plan for them, but they need to repent of sin and trust in him. And they're like, get out of my face. Who are you to judge me? Well, my natural response is to start judging them. I'm like, I'm not judging you, but you should be judged. And uh, you know how that works. So he's saying we can't rule over them. We can't sit in judgment on them because that's what comes natural. We're going to have to function as he would in that situation. We have his example in every instance. So he's literally saying, stop judging and stop condemning. Wednesday night, we got to look at Jonah's story and we were just reminded that here's a guy who's on the payroll. He's working for God. He's a prophet of God. And God says, I have a ministry, a mission for you. He's like, great. Where do I go? He says, Nineveh. And he's like, there's no way. He doesn't even argue with God. He just got on a ship to go the other direction. But God, as you are well aware, if he decides to, can have his way. 
He is sovereign. That's sort of the theological term for it. He can press the point and get it done if he so desires. Sometimes he'll just let us say no and we'll do what we want to our own loss. He'll get someone to accomplish his will. In Jonah's case, it's like, no, you're my guy. And Jonah's like, not really. And he's like, no, you are. And, and Jonah's like, well, I'm going this way. He goes, we'll see. And eventually Jonah ends up in Nineveh where he preaches a message he didn't want to preach, though it was not a message of redemption. It wasn't God loves you guys and has a beautiful plan for your life. And, and if you'll just surrender, no, it's like 40 days and you're dead. And, and, and I'm sure Jonah enjoyed that part. Because he hated the Ninevites. That's very clear. Why? He had judged them as being unworthy of the mercy that God was showing him daily. And when Jonah was in the belly of the fish, he actually cried out for mercy. And then when he preached to the Ninevites and God showed mercy on them because they did in fact repent. The one thing he was so afraid might happen. I knew it. You're long suffering and merciful and gracious. I hate that about you, Lord. It's, it's like, why did you have to forgive them? That's Jonah's heart, see? And that's the heart that, that judges and condemns. Now, judging is an internal thing. It's making decisions about people when we have no business making those decisions. Condemning, on the other hand, is actually an outward expression of that inward reality. It is sentencing them, not just saying you're unworthy, but you're going to hell and that's where you need to go. And I'm glad you're going. And, and so, well, what's God's heart in all of this? It's to acquit to forgive, to, to extend his mercy and grace, not just to us, but through us. So he tells them, you're going to have to stop judging. You're going to have to stop condemning. And then he says, you're going to need to be forgiving and you're going to need to keep giving. To forgive means to no longer hold against another that thing that they've done. It, it literally translates out in the Greek, the language of the New Testament, to put away. In other words, when God forgives my sin and your sin, he casts it, he says, as far as east is from west and remembers it no more. So when we come saying, Lord, I'm so sorry about that sin that I confessed yesterday, but feel guilty over. He says, what sin? What sin? I've cast that sin as far as the east is from the west. He remembers it no more. There's something else. The word forgive, and the first time I did a word study on it and found this, I was kind of flabbergasted and confused for a, a moment because it's the same word translated divorce. And then I'm like, that makes no sense to me, Lord. I mean, if there's forgiveness, there won't be a divorce. That's the whole point, isn't it? But, but the reason it's the same word is to divorce is to put away your wife. And to forgive is to put away the sin. And so it simply means to put it away, to no longer deal as if that were reality. Now, there are some great illustrations in Scripture, and we don't have time for all of them. But the very first time the word forgive appears in Scripture the book of Genesis, but all the way in chapter 50. Most of the first in Genesis you find early on. Joseph had been sold by his brothers into slavery and through a series of fortuitous events, the sovereignty of God, he had found himself second in command in all of Egypt. I'm really shortening the story. It's 11 chapters long. You should read it sometime. But the bottom line is his brothers ultimately stand before him. He blesses them. But then when the dad dies, well, they're afraid of him because they feel guilty and they know they deserve some punishment. And they come and they said, listen, forgive us. Forgive us. Dad wants you to forgive us. You need to forgive us. It's the first time the word appears. And he says to them, listen, am I in the place of God? He goes, you meant it for evil. That's clear to all. But God meant it for good. He sent me ahead of you to save many souls alive. Joseph was able not only to forgive, and this is the key for those of us who've been so wounded, so hurt, so misused or abused to say, well, I just can't see how I could ever forgive that person. You can. He wouldn't command you to do it if he couldn't make it possible for you to do it or wouldn't make it possible for you to do it. 
But the way we forgive is we realize God's forgiven me everything and God's working all things together for good. And, and does that mean those guys aren't guilty or that it's OK that they did it? Of course not. Does it mean we put ourselves in a position where we're once again going to be misused and abused? Of course not. But it means we no longer harbor the hatred or the bitterness or the unforgiveness that eats us up and devastates us, not them. It destroys us and those closest to us. So Joseph says, you meant it for evil, that, that we can all see, but God meant it for good. And Romans 8, 28 says, all things are working together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purposes. What that means isn't that everything that happens is good or God approves it or God was somehow causing it. No, we're responsible for the evil in the world. If men ever ask you, well, how do you account for all the evil in the world? I said, check a mirror. It's like we're responsible for that part. But how do we account for the good in the world is really the question. Why are some people so giving and forgiving? Why would people spend their lives for others who have no way of repaying them? How do you explain that? We explain it because people are being transformed formed by a God who is pure good, pure righteousness, pure holiness. Well, stop judging, he says, start, stop condemning, be forgiving. By the way, the last time this word forgive appears in scripture, you know the passage, you might not know it's 1 John 1, 9. It's if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So the first is, is, people who are guilty and realize they, they really deserve punishment asking for forgiveness. And the last is a promise that if we'll confess our sin, he will forgive us our sin. And then he says, we need to keep on giving. I say keep giving because these are all present tense and they're all exhortations. They're all imperatives. They're commandments of our Lord. Now this idea to give means not only can't we be retaliating, not only can't we be returning evil for evil, but we need to return good for good. And the picture here is, is mercy on those who've, well, not shown us mercy and, and grace to those who've been anything but gracious to us. By the way, that word grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. It's a great way to understand what grace is. God's riches at Christ's expense. Well, he gives us a picture of bushels of blessing, literally. Given it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put in your bosom. For with the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, many apply this to temporal riches. In other words, if we give to the poor, God will give to us. And I don't want to disagree with that. I believe it's a fine and biblical application, but it is not the primary interpretation. Why? Because this is all given in a context. And the context is you go to represent me. They hate and reject you. You return good for evil. And so he's saying, here's how much good you're going to need to give. Every time you're offended, every time you're accused, every time you're slandered, every time you need to return good. And the idea is you can never outgive God. He will give you all the mercy you need, not just for you. And aren't you grateful that his mercies are new every morning? But, but he'll give you mercy for others, bushels of blessings bushels of grace and that's the picture we don't want to limit this to giving stuff to needy people though certainly we can apply it and should that way but the giving describes the continual blessing of being someone who well through whom God can channel I hate to use the word all these new age implications but but through whom God can pour his blessings into the lives of others if you get to Israel, you will no doubt visit the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea, lowest place on the earth, saltiest place on the earth. And, and it's an interesting phenomenon. It's one of the few 
seas or lakes. It's really a lake, but they call everything a sea over there. And, you know, but anyway, that it's one of the few places where where there are inlets, but no outlets. And that's why it's dead. Fresh water goes in. Fish come with the fresh water. But the salt is so radical and strong that and there's no outlet. So it just the fresh water is instantly polluted. Anything that gets in there dies and and can't survive. And, and there's a picture there for us. One I'm sure he intends that, that we can't just be receiving the good and fresh and, and pure waters of God's mercy and grace and word and and then not allow those to flow from our lives. It brings death. Well, he speaks a parable to him in verse 39. He asked the question, can the blind lead the blind? The answer, of course, is sure, but is it wise? And uh, he goes on to say, here's what's going to happen. Will they not both fall into a ditch? Now, this is a physical picture, of course, with a spiritual lesson. And he actually speaks of three kinds of people with some kind of visual impairment. He begins with the blind We'll see him talking to the Pharisees, the conservative religious leaders of his day, and actually calling them blind guides. So he uses this very imagery, this very picture in Matthew 13 as he says, woe to you and woe to you and woe to you. And all the woes are for those who had, well, misrepresented him, having been given the opportunity to, to stand for him. So first type of person that is impaired visually, he says, are the blind. And of course, he's talking to those who are blind spiritually. He says, listen, they're going to lead others and they're going to lead them into a pit. Now, the Old Testament says the wise man sees the pit and avoids it, but the fool digs a pit and falls into it. Now, I like that contrast for a couple reasons. He's not just saying that the foolish man wanders and falls in. No, he actually digs the pit himself and then falls into it. And, and so we want to make sure we're in the wise category, you see. We don't want to be a fool. The second kind of visually impaired person that he addresses would be the one with a, a speck in his eye. He does say in verse 40, though, sandwiched between, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. And I do have to pause and camp on that for just a moment with you, because here's some very good news. If you've ever thought, as I have, how amazing would it have been to be with Jesus, to be one of those guys, to, to hear his voice and to, to learn from him personally? Listen, we have the same words he spoke to them that, that transformed them. We have the same Holy Spirit that he gave to them that empowered them. He is discipling us as we're in his word and submitted to him. He is here. And so while it would have been awesome to have that experience, hey, we have this experience in the midst of a world that's either oblivious to him or hostile to him. We are being discipled by Jesus, trained by Jesus through his word and by his spirit. And what he's saying is everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. That's the hope we have. Every day that I'm in this word and submitted to it, obedient to it, I'm going to become a little more like Jesus. Now, I've been married to Pam for a very long time. I won't tell you how long because it'll make her sound old and she's definitely not. But uh, th the thing is, is we weren't Christians in the early years. We, we got married a few years after we met. We had our first child a few years later. We still weren't Christians. We named him. I've shared this with you. We named him Nathan. And people think, well, that's a good Bible name. Now we were naming him after Nat King Cole. But, but, but the issue here is this. It is that she lived with me for a very long time before I became a Christian. And, and I wasn't the worst of all the husbands I ever saw. I guarantee you that. But I'm far from the best husband I've ever seen. And, and if you're married to someone and you're like, man, you've been a Christian five years. I mean, how long does this transformation take? A little longer than that, guaranteed. 
And, and, and here's what we need to know. We look back and we can thank God we're not what we used to be. We, we look forward and we know, OK, I'm far from what I will be, but I'm not what I used to be. And so we want to be patient with one another. We, we want to just be loving and thank God for the changes that have taken place and pray that the rest will continue. And hey, God could speed that up. We'd love that. But, but the bottom line is, he says, as we're trained by him, we will become like him. And, and then he says, why look at the speck in your brother's eye and not perceive the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, brother, let me remove the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the plank that is in your own eye? Hypocrite. First, remove the plank from your own eye. Then you will see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. Now, some reading this somehow come to the conclusion, OK, stop judging, stop condemning. You know, uh, don't be a hypocrite. So, OK, I'm not going to do anything or say anything. I mean, I see people struggling, but I don't want to get involved. I, I know I have plank and in my eye and no, no, listen, that's that's not what he's saying. He's saying when we recognize that we are impaired, know this. Everybody can see the plank, but you. He's giving a picture that would have made the children laugh for sure. And maybe even the adults, because you see someone with the speck and most of us have had this experience. You're outside. The wind comes up. Something goes into your eye. You're trying to get it, but you keep doing this thing. and You can't find it. So you're like, hey, can you see it? You know, and you're doing that whole weird thing. And if you have somebody kind enough to, to try to help with it, that's an awesome thing. But if they come up and they've got a big old two by four hanging out their eye, you're like, whoa, no thanks, you know. <laughs> eye surgery requires somebody who can see clearly. It's so important. And, and, and so he's not saying if you have a plank, which from time to time we will, he's not saying, well, then you can't help. He's saying first deal with the plank. Then you'll be able to see clearly. Don't miss this part. So you can remove the speck that's in your brother's eye. It's that ministry of restoration. It's not just bringing people to Jesus, though that's primary. Because without him, they perish and, and go into a Christless eternity. It's more than that, though. It's helping them day to day become more like Christ by being an example, by sharing his word and, and by trying to help them deal with those things that are hindering them. And that's what the speck represent, the plank, obviously serious impairment. But whether it's someone who is spiritually blind or someone who's got a speck or someone who has a plank, in every case, the goal is the same, spiritual restoration. You who are spiritual, Galatians says, if you see a brother in sin, you who are spiritual, go to him and restore him in a spirit of meekness and humility, lest you likewise be tempted. You will see brothers in sin, by the way. All you got to do is hang out. I mean, it's going to happen. We all fall short of the glory of God. It's, I wish it were past tense, but it's present tense. It still happens. So the question is, when I see my brother in sin, what am I going to do? He says, well, Here's what you used to do and what you normally would do. You judge and condemn them. So stop that and instead be forgiving and giving and then do something to help them with the sin they're struggling with. Remove the plank, then remove the speck. And if you think again, well, you who are spiritual, that's not me. He's talking to those who are listening to the spirit, who are led of the spirit, who are empowered by the spirit. He's not talking about super spiritual. He's just talking about not walking after the flesh, not living a carnal life, somebody who actually cares for the spiritual things. Unforgiveness is a poison. We are told that we must forgive as we have been forgiven, even to the point that those who refuse to forgive others will not be forgiven by the Father. Here is a verse that I hope will help you to not carry unforgiveness in your heart, even for a moment. Acts 3.19 says, Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. You see, forgiveness blots out sin. When we refuse to forgive, even for a short time, we allow that sin that was committed against us to take up residence within us, and we relive it over and over again. 
Now, I don't know about you, but I have enough of my own sin to deal with. I certainly do not want to allow anyone else's sin to take control of me. I prefer the times of refreshing in the presence of the Lord. The Calvary Road is a ministry of Calvary Chapel Chico, and you can visit our website, ccchico.com, or download the CC Chico app to contact us and listen to other studies from Pastor Sam. You can also listen to The Calvary Road as a daily podcast by visiting thecalvaryroad.com. We'd love to hear from you. And until next time, may you find grace and peace as your journey takes you down the Calvary Road. And your grace.